ladies and gentlemen. How are all of you this morning? Good. I'm very, very happy to be here. I thank Ayala for inviting me from Singapore. Um, I'd like to tell a little bit of a story because um, I've actually met uh, your president before. And this was last year at the World Economic Forum. I was covering um, the meeting and I was on the way to the ladies when I heard a very loud commotion and I met Mr. Duterte coming up to the toilet at the same time with me, but he was flanked by 20 bodyguards. And I thought, I'd be really nervous if I had to go to the toilet with 20 other people. Um, but anyway, I was um, really, really happy to hear about um, his plan for the Philippines. And he has a really ambitious infrastructure development plan called Build, Build, Build. And at the meeting, what really struck me about what he said was that sustainable development for the Philippines is really crucial. And if you think about climate change effects and you know, some of the things that Sunny and Steve has already mentioned, really this is very important for the country, very important for the businesses. And I have to say that for Ayala to be putting up a conference on integrated risk and sustainability, really you are ahead of the pack. So I really, really commend you. I'm very privileged this morning to be sitting among captains of industry and I would like to introduce them to join me on stage. Um, and that's none other than Jaime Agosto Zobo Diala, the chairman and CEO of Ayala Corporation. And also Mr. Sunny Verghese, co-founder and group CEO, Olam International. as well as Mr. Steve Schmieder, Founder and Chief Innovation Officer of Resonance Global. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here this morning. I'm very, very privileged to be having this discussion with you on risk management and sustainability. I've been a journalist for more than 10 years now, had a front seat in seeing how sustainability has gone from a fringe issue more than 10 years ago when I was at the Straits Times and begging my editors to publish stories on climate change or resilience or sustainability. So now we're seeing it on the global agenda, um, the G20 meetings, the Paris Accord, the UN meetings. I think, you know, like you said, Sunny, the time has come for sustainability. So when we think about something like integrated risk and sustainability, Jaime, I would like to start with you. Ayala has obviously been leading this in Philippines and I would say in Asia. How do you approach these two subjects and actually implement them into business strategies such that the business benefits from it? Uh, thank you, uh, Jessica. Let me, um, maybe before answering that, uh, thank Sunny and Steve uh, for the frameworks they put. Sunny, um, uh, we were just chatting before coming in, uh, founded uh, Olam, a massively successful global company. Uh, he, he gave us statistics on it, which now has Mitsubishi Corporation as a partner in Tamasic, uh, two companies that are very close to us as well, Sunny. But congratulations for everything you've done. And Steve, thank you for also addressing a whole range of different topics, including demographics, which is actually a massively important component of what the Philippines is today. Um, I think if we go back a couple of years, sustainability is something that we embraced some years back, Jessica, because we have always believe that uh, for the company to be relevant, we're 185 years old, um, we have to continue being relevant to the changing nature uh, of the environment we're in. And um, it is something that we've believed in for some time now in Ayala, and uh, we've begun to dovetail that to issues that are affecting capitalism in general, which is how to make private sector groups more and more relevant to the development needs of a country. I think what's very significant about what Sunny said and what Steve said is we're beginning to see the, 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 the first arches of individuals and leaders in corporations moving beyond what is good for the corporation alone and even moving beyond what is good for the nation state. People are beginning to unite around themes that are important to the world. The things that Sunny and, and Steve mentioned are issues of a global nature, problems that we face globally. And once upon a time, if you go back either to our business school training or corporate training, people were just focused on what was good for the corporation. And then maybe it extended beyond that to maybe what was good for the country. But I think what's fascinating about Sunny and Steve's themes is these are global themes, things that are important to the world, and putting emphasis on things where we can contribute to a global issue. You know, that is not a normal theme. Um, and I have great respect for the two themes, only because I think all of us have a role to play in beginning to address issues that affect us all. 
Um, Sunny's uh, call, eloquently spoken during his talk, are themes that go beyond um, uh, you know, the normal corporate view. And from our point of view in Ayala, we're very much aligned to that way of thinking. I think issues that align us to the needs uh, of our country and where we can begin to address global issues should be a central theme of what we are as individuals. Maybe one theme that didn't come up with the two speakers is issues of inclusivity. Um, if you look at the Ayala of 20 years ago, uh, Jessica, we were a corporation with certainly very good brands, but we were dealing with a very small percentage of the Philippine population. I think we made it a mandate some years back that we wanted to leave a legacy of relevance to the changing nature of the Philippines. As was mentioned, we're a country that's grown tremendously. We're over 100 million people now. Yet Ayala, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, only touched a, a, a tiny uh, minority of that population. And, and we set a goal for ourselves to say, beyond the issues brought up by these two individuals, how can we be more relevant to the vast majority of Filipinos? And that created a new impulse to also include inclusiveness in the way we did business. It changed our business models. Ayala Land had one product line at one point in time. It now has five dealing with different income groups. Uh, the Bank of the Philippine Islands had a three million uh, client base. It's now moving up to five and six as we move on uh, to uh, uh, microfinance and, and dealing with smaller business communities. Our water business really deals with informal settlers like it deals with high-end individuals. Uh, the list goes on and on. Globe Telecom as well, you know, now with 55 million customers, is touching more than, than half the population base of the country. Increasingly inclusivity and engaging and empowering people at all income levels is one more theme in addition to issues of sustainability and, uh, and, and the demographics also that Steve mentioned. So in all those broad themes, we're very much aligned to the elements brought up. The sustainability issue to finish off is, is massively important because we're talking about really uh, creating an institution that will have a legacy and have the legs to move on into the future. It can't do that if it's not relevant to the vast development needs as well um, of the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaime. I want to come back to some of those themes, but perhaps now I can turn to Sunny. Um, the WBCSD issued a report on enterprise risk management and sustainability, which I read. It was a 100-page report that took some time digesting. Um, but it made some very uh, pertinent observations and that um, risk managers today in many, many companies, and I think you know Ayala and Olam are leading the way on this, but many companies are not looking at sustainability risks as a key part of their risk strategy. How do you think companies should be um, you know, awoken to the fact that it's important? And at WBCSD, what is your role in, in that? Sure. So Jessica is uh, referring to a piece of work that WBCSD did on uh, measuring, uh, looking at the company's uh, uh, financial statements and the filings on what they believe the risks of the company are and then comparing it to their sustainability report in terms of the material areas those companies are focused on. And this study that was published in 2017 showed that only 29% match between what the companies filed as their major legal and economic risks and the focus on the material areas with regard to sustainability. So there was obviously a disconnect. So how do companies link this together? So I'll just give you an example of what we do in OLAM. Our, so most companies use two or three frameworks in terms of their enterprise-wide risk management. So one framework they potentially use is the COSO framework, and the second framework that they use is the ISO 31000 framework, or some companies have combined these frameworks and developed their own enterprise risk framework. In OLAM's case, we have combined it to develop a framework which basically identifies 51 risks across 11 risk categories. For example, trading risk is a category. Within trading risk, we have a price risk as a risk event. We have basis risk. We have uh, structure risk. We have ARB risk. We have, because we deal in derivatives and options, et cetera, we have a Greeks risk as well and a liquidity risk. Then we have operational risk. We have eight risks and operational risk a stock risk, a quality risk, a credit risk, a counterparty risk, an asset utilization risk. So there are eight operational risks and so on and so forth. So when you look at ESG broadly as a definition of a sustainability, for me the E and the S, the environmental risk that the company has and the social risk that the company has 
is very idiosyncratic to the company, the context and the sector it is in. The governance risk is common across all sectors, industries and companies. So governance risk would include policies on anti-corruption, anti-bribery, uh, money laundering, anti-money laundering, anti-terrorism financing, all of the governance and that is common to every company that is a entry ticket to participate in that business or that industry and it's not idiosyncratic. Environmental risks are very idiosyncratic and even within a company like Olam where we are in 18 business units, in each business unit the risk profile and the intensity of the risks, these 51 risks in the 11 categories are very different. So if I look at the palm plantation business that we are in and the palm business that we are in, the vectors of environmental exposure is significantly more than say rice, the vectors of environmental exposure, very different. So we need to understand for every one of our business units, what is the risk profile and the risk intensity profile across these 51 risk and 11 risk categories. And then we are saying in terms of return expectations, if you have a business unit that has a higher risk profile, we expect a higher hurdle rate for those businesses to meet to compensate for the risk I'm talking of the risks that we want to take. There are risks in terms of the governances that we will never contemplate taking, irrespective of whether you can uh, generate excessive returns on that. I just want to go back to a point that Steve made in his speech. I don't want the audience to feel that when we talk about sustainability and risk, we're only talking about risk in the negative connotation in terms of what it can take away from the business, but it's also about the opportunity. I was fortunate to be part of the Business and Sustainable Development Commission and we came up with the report Better World, Better Business and that report identified $12 trillion worth of opportunity for companies that want to, as Steve has mentioned in Globalization 3.0, capture the sustainability price. Uh, let me give you one example in, in the case of Olam. We have now bread and onion variety. I told you that we are big dehydrators of onion which has improved solid content in that onion from something like 11% uh, 10 years ago to now 26.5%. So when your onions have higher solid content, you evaporate less water when you're dehydrating, you use less energy to evaporate the water, you need less land to grow the onions. We have five factories that process the onions just in California. And that has meant that we have saved 65 million cubic meters of water. We have reduced the land under cultivation for the onions by about 7,500 hectares. And the company has saved about $100 million. We have now installed dendrometers, IoT sensors in our almond orchards, for example, which detects the moisture stress in the plant because when the plant has got moisture stress, the tree trunk will shrink. When it has got adequate moisture, it will expand. But this movement is very infinitesimal, not visible to the naked eye. But these sensors can pick up that stress and you can then target your irrigation interventions to the precise part of the acreage of plants. We have improved water usage efficiencies by 25 to 27 percent. So maximizing crop power. So I think there is an opportunity and is also mitigation of risk. Thank you very much, Tani, for that explanation. I want to come to you, Steve. Um, we just actually opened our eco-business office in the Philippines yesterday, and uh, we had um, Mr. Ernie Lopez, the president of uh, ABS-CBN, come, and he's the brother of Gina Lopez, um, who is obviously very well known in the Philippines. And one thing he said, um, you know, was striking to me, and he said, even though there are a handful of companies in the Philippines that understand what sustainable development means and how they marry risk and sustainability, but the majority of companies still do not see that. And for you, you know, working with so many companies across the globe, what is the awareness level of how important these issues are? And how do you um, get these companies to realize that you know, looking at sustainability as a risk issue is absolutely critical to survival? Sure, no, um, is this on? Yeah, okay. It's a, you know, it's a really good question. I, I, I go back to, some very early engagements we had when we first formed the company, and we were working in the mining sector. And one of, the, one of our clients, the CEO, uh, when he called me in and sat me down, he said, look, I just dug a $200 million hole in the ground that I can't exploit because of social license to operate, right? They had alienated the local community. He's like, I can never have that again, or I'm out of business. And that to me was a moment where sustainability and risk, right, that social license to operate really crystallized. 
Now, if we fast forward to today, I think what you see, to Sonny's point, is a lot of variation based on industry, right? Industries that have either been in the spotlight, so for example, the seafood industry, right, has just gotten raked through the coals over the last few years about human trafficking and modern slavery. They're now on board with dealing with this issue because they have no choice, right? Nobody wants to be in The Guardian or The New York Times for that sort of thing repeatedly, right? But then you have other industries. Um, we, 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 we're working with a client right now in India, and they're a large multinational food and beverage company. And they have an issue, for example, of sourcing potatoes for crisps, for potato chips. And the problem they face is they can't, they, they have increasing demand, right? The Indian market's growing very quickly. But conversely, their ability to source potatoes reliably from India is becoming constrained, right? And India is not a place where you can just easily increase the amount of arable land, right? So the one way you can, you can really address this is what? Well, if you want to increase agricultural yields, global research shows one of the best ways of doing that is involving women into agriculture. It has been globally proven, especially for smallholder farmers, that if women are more heavily involved in agricultural processes, that, they, uh, that agricultural productivity can go up. And so here we have a food and beverage company that I would describe as conservative. Right? This is not one of the companies that maybe is, is spending a lot of time with, uh, with Sunny on, on the WBCSD, right? But even they have come to recognize how this has changed. And so I think what you're seeing is companies on a continuum. I think the companies that are heavily involved in emerging markets tend to be more sensitive to this. When, when I look in the U.S. at more domestically oriented companies, I would say the U.S. is, is in many ways behind. Um, it's those companies that are working in emerging markets where these pain points are going from minor issues at the periphery to the core of business, right, that, where, where we're really seeing the shift. Thank you very much. I think that's a really, really interesting observation. Um, I'd like to encourage our guests here this morning to submit your questions on Slido. Um, you have the opportunity to ask your questions to our guests and uh, our speakers. And um, just before I go to those questions, though, um, Jaime, I just want to come back to you because um, I was really amused to see that the poll this morning uh, had my boss <laughs> under why you're here. Um, but really, I can see the leadership that uh, the C-suite has um, in both Olam and in Ayala. But how do you communicate that down to your line managers and your directors? Because this is something that I get very often with the businesses that I interview and they're like, you know, we believe in it, but it's so hard to get the employees engaged on this issue to see that they really make a material difference. So how do you convince your employees that this is something that they also have to believe in and integrate into their daily roles beyond the fact that it's a top-down approach? Well, Jessica, maybe just two elements. Uh, one of them was very eloquently put by Sunny in his remarks earlier. Number one, you have to believe from a philosophical point of view uh, and a visioning point of view that that is integral and an important component of what you believe in. Uh, fundamentally, both Fernando and I, uh, and I think our, our, our top executives, uh, are completely convinced that if you can build a sustainable model uh, into the institution, and, and that covers much more than the environment, about issues of how you treat your employees, your engagement in the national development agenda, and, and issues that include inclusivity as well, then you're creating a framework for an institution to be relevant in the future. Um, so first and foremost, you have to believe it as a philosophy, and by the way, that's not a necessarily natural thing. Business training in the past involved none of this. Certainly, well, I'm getting close to 60 now, but when I was in my 20s, uh, this was not a topic discussed by anyone. And so that engagement of a more modern, more responsible capitalism is something that I like to think and we're proud of that we've always believed in, uh, in the Ayala group, but it's only been current in more recent years. So philosophically, you have to have uh, leadership teams in the group that are philosophically aligned to that way of thinking, and it drives the way you do business, number one. Number two, I think we have to change the metrics by which we measure people, and you go back to how do you begin to inculcate that, and, and, um, and uh, individuals in, in institutions also align themselves to the metrics by which they are measured. And um, I think being the first company, uh, a lot of it with TG's help, 
to create an integrated report uh, in the Philippines uh, for the first time where we have moved beyond uh, the financials required of us by the SEC, which is the traditional uh, range of measurements that institutional investors measure us by and stockholders in general, and integrated a whole new set of parameters uh, to that. We follow, uh, Sunny, the GRI uh, standards, uh, and we've used that as our own measurement. But uh, now we're beginning to also align ourselves to the 17 uh, United Nations Development Goals uh, by beginning to widen the scope um, of the way we measure ourselves and the way we measure executives. We begin to inculcate the, a, a new philosophy on how people are being looked at. I think it also reflects on the way we would like um, institutional stockholders and stockholders in general to view us. Uh, I've always believed that corporations play a far more important role in our country than we're given credit for. We're looked at under the PNL uh, profit and, and, and loss lens, but in fact, corporations generally contribute so much more beyond employment. We're engaged in innovation, developing new things, getting products and services to consumers at lower and lower price points in more and more imaginative ways, and technology has helped us in that respect. We're a major driver, I like to think, uh, for a country, but yet, when we're judged sometimes, it's just either you're making too much profits or, 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 or too big in a specific sector, when really there's so many other factors uh, that come to our reason for being and, and our own um, engagement, I guess, with the development agenda of a country. I think an integrated report, new metrics that go beyond the traditional financial ones, and integrating those metrics into the way we measure ourselves is one big way beyond uh, the philosophical side of engaging, I guess, the employee community in a new way of looking at the corporation. And by the way, they're not all necessarily uh, negatives. I think Sunny pointed out that many of these are new opportunities by saving uh, funds here or creating new ways of, um, of, of engaging uh, with the environment, uh, with the social communities, and reinventing our engagement in those spaces. You create many positive externalities that are exciting in and of themselves. Thank you very much. Um, I must congratulate Ayala for being the first company in the Philippines to actually publish an integrated report. And I think sustainability reporting as a whole in Asia has been emerging and helping to push um, you know, disclosures as well as responsible reporting of certain ESG indicators. But let's talk about money for a while. Sunny, what you said during your speech about how you came to your board and you wanted to spend 10% of your P&L on sustainability initiatives and you, know, you get a bit of a pushback. has Integrating these considerations in your business been good for the bottom line? How do you get over the hump of having to make the initial investments and convincing your shareholders that you need to do that before you're able to reap the benefits? So I think as uh, Hemi just mentioned, uh, you have to be able to measure. Uh, so what is the opportunity? I'll give you one example. We launched a product early this year called Olam at Source, where we promise our customers that if you buy your cocoa beans or cocoa ingredients or coffee, soluble coffee, etc., from us or edible nuts from us, we will give you guarantees on 12 sustainability indicators across people, planet, and livelihoods. Uh, 80 sustainability indicators. So we will tell them from the social side, which farmers did we buy from? We geotag these farmers. What is the size of his household? What is the education level in that household? Then we say, how many extension training programs did we provide that farmer on good agricultural practices to improve his productivity? How did his yields go up? What did happen to his real incomes? How did we change that? So we'll give him many, so 80 sustainability indicators. Some are social indicators, some are environmental indicators. And similarly on the environmental side, we'll say, what is a carbon footprint, water footprint, waste footprint for delivering that ton of cocoa to them. Now this has allowed us now to get more stickiness with our customers, get a larger share of a customer's wallet, and get an incremental margin. We have pricing power. Because the mantra for us in Olam is you have to first differentiate before you scale. And the oxymoron is that we are in a commodity business, which means it's undifferentiated. So Cocoa sold on Cocoa Association of London terms, standardized contracts and attributes. So in order to create a differentiation, branding our ingredients that we supply as at source, uh, validated and verified by third-party assurance, all the claims that we make on those 80 indicators. That is what has enabled us to issue this $500 million sustainability bond, where uh, on 40 indicators, 
uh, measured by an external party, our cost of borrowing will come down if we improve our targets on those 40 indicators. So this is an example of then convincing your shareholders and your board, which might be otherwise skeptical, that there is real dollar and cents value in this. On the other part, which is the spend that you do on sustainability initiatives, on building human capital, or digital innovation, etc., you're not going to see the benefits immediately next year. So if you're not willing to take a hit to your PNL next year, with the faith that you're creating strategic assets that will drive future cash flows and create long-term value, and that is what you need to establish. And in order to establish that, as Hemi just mentioned, we have to be able to measure it. So we use natural capital accounting protocol to measure all the natural capital uh, indicators. We use the social capital accounting pr protocol to measure the social capital indicators. We then use uh, our own way of calculating human capital, and measuring human capital, engagement scores, inspiration scores, uh, attrition rates, and all of that, and say, how will this predict a future value of the company? And by integrating all of this is where we can, and then also linking the company's purpose to the individual employee's purpose is very important to get that alignment. So purpose for us has to answer the question, what are we all on fire about? Why do we come to work every day? What is our cause? What is the problem that we are trying to solve in our industry? So if you don't give people that purpose, and they don't see a relationship between their small P, their purpose, and the company's larger P, then you're not going to get traction. So we launched a program called uh, the Reimagineer program, where we asked volunteers from the company, those of you who have ideas on how we can reimagine global agriculture, produce more with less resources, come up with it. We had 400 people volunteer. This is not by appointment. Volunteer, and they are now driving a movement across the company. They are reaching the 72,000 employees and tapping those ideas and then incorporating and implementing those ideas, which will dramatically transform our differentiation in the industry. Thank you very much, Sunny. I think there are two things here. One is absolutely competitive advantage and brand loyalty amongst your customers. And the other thing as well is money. You know, your investors are actually giving you cheaper loans because you're performing on sustainability. Thank you. Just want to go to the Slido questions now um, to take some questions from our guests here this morning. Can we have the questions up? Oh, it's here, sorry. <laughs> So I think the top rated question here now, I think is a question for you, Jaime, and it's how can Ayala influence other businesses and organizations to have that same mindset of integrating risk and sustainability? So beyond your employees, how do you go out into the business community? Well, I think uh, I'd like to take a page from what Sunny uh, is doing. Uh, Sunny has been an extraordinary example, actually. I was in Singapore and I attended a stewardship conference and and Sunny uh, certainly not only had a, a, a prime role, uh, but was the person who interviewed uh, Ho Ching, who is basically the CEO of Temasek. And I was mentioning to Sunny at the table earlier how Temasek, as a holding company, uh, a state company, has really taken this and made it a driving force of what they would like Singapore to represent in the future. Um, I guess the point I'm making is all of us have to lead by example, uh, Jessica. We can't force other people to, do, to, 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 to move along a certain way. But I like to think that Ayala has developed a reputation in industry uh, as a leader. And thanks to the work that everybody in this room does and the leadership provided, um, people look at us. And I think leading by example, doing things uh, the way we believe in rather than, than preaching, but more sharing, as Sunny does so eloquently, the advantages of this and tying ourselves to some broader goals. I, I do like to think that generally, uh, above the average, most individuals like to align themselves to a broader goal that goes beyond their daily work, and Sunny has said that very eloquently. It's a natural instinct, I think, of human beings to be participatory in broader uh, issues. If you show ways that you can do it, and if you show ways where the company is engaged in these broader issues, I do believe it sets an example that others will follow. I also think, and going back to demographics, uh, as a country of, 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 with a lot of young people, um, I think there is a significant new trend for young people to be far more idealistic and, and less cynical than, than, than the elder generations. Uh, and I'm not casting aspersions on, on our generation, but generally those themes are strong. And Sonny made reference to the influence his own children have had on him. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, and, and I find myself in a similar situation. They touch on themes that were 
not important in our time and make you reflect on them. I think with young people coming up, um, they will align themselves to these new messages, these new senses of relevance that corporations are moving into, and I think they themselves will spread the word as they enter these other institutions. But more than anything, setting an example is probably the best way to go. Thank you very much, Jaime. Um, I want to come to you, Steve. I mean, there's a very interesting question here from our guests, and it's that governments are stepping back from climate commitments. And where you're from, Donald Trump is not exactly the beacon of light in the world at the moment. Um, <laughs> so how can private sector, uh, the private sector fill in the void? I mean, we've just seen a huge climate summit in San Francisco on global climate action in which all the American states have been committing to do um, climate action ahead of the federal government. But in terms of the private sector, what role do they have to step in where governments are not showing leadership? I mean, I, I think it's really interesting, and, and the U.S. is a, a peculiar case, right, where we have incredible dysfunction at the federal level, and I would argue deep political rot. Right? What we're seeing, and this isn't, Trump is a symptom, he is not the disease, right? And it's very important for all of us to understand the, the difference between the signal and the noise, right? And the signal is there's deep political rot and, and Trump is just, in many ways, just noise. But I think, you know, it's important to remember if you, you know, if you look at the US, for example, right? Trump originally proposed cutting the foreign aid budget by a third. You know what happened? Congress increased it by 7%, right? They, they just t totally disregarded his, his wishes, and they did that again, they're doing that again this year, right? So his first two budgets, he got, he got nowhere. Now that being said, the US scores relatively low, for example, on commitment to aid, right? There, there's a new report that was out this week that showed Sweden, I think, as number one. The US is sort of middling or, or fairly, fairly low. But I think it's important for everyone to remember that what governments can bring and what the private sector can bring can be highly complementary if done in the right way. So for example, you know, let's take a new investment opportunity, right? Sonny was referring to how, they, how Olam is getting loans on better terms. Well, I bet if you dug back into that, right, why the bank is doing that is it probably went back to the IFC, right, the IFC principles, right? That then permeated through the, 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 the banks to become accepted wisdom, right? And, and a way of de-risking investments. And I think what you're gonna see is, yes, governments in some ways are taking steps back, but they're also starting to offer up more tools that, that the private sector can leverage, whether that's things like blended finance, right? That can be de-risking loans, it can be taking first loss provisions, project preparation grants, and so forth, or alternatively doing partnerships. Right? And Olam has been really at the forefront of this globally. I, I, I first encountered Olam in Ghana maybe 12 or 13 years ago and was blown away by this company I had never heard of, right? was doing such amazing things in partnership with DFID, with USAID, with Gates, basically any company or any sort of governmental entity they, they, they could find. And so do I think governments are taking a step back? to a degree, and certainly in, in the US case, we have some dysfunction at the federal level. But I also think there, there are new tools that are being deployed by governments around the world that the private sector can leverage to achieve sustainable outcomes. Thank you very much. I'm getting the signal that we're running out of time. But just before we wrap up this panel, I'd like to perhaps ask of each of you if there is one thing that you'd like our audience to take away today on integrating risk and sustainability, what would that be? Steve, perhaps we start with you. So I think the number one thing to take away is what we need is an alignment of sort of people, processes, and values, right? And I think here we have a commitment at the values level, for sure, that's demonstrated by all of us being here today. I think, you know, Ayala has the people to do it, and then what's going to need to happen are the processes, right? That, sure, the integrated report's the first step, but it's only the first step. It's how you use that report. It's how it integrates to strategy. It's how it integrates to execution. That's gonna be really important. Thank you very much. Sunny, your one thing. Yeah, the one thing is be the change that you want to see in others. Thank you. Very well said. Hi, May. Uh, finally, maybe um, uh, to go back to the theme of the conference, sustainability and risk, 
I think increasingly uh, we're all being analyzed uh, along terms that, are, that go beyond the traditional metrics that we've been looked at. I think integrating risk and elements of risk into this new sustainability initiative is a new way for us to understand that not doing, uh, uh, not, not committing ourselves to issues that are part of a new global standard on sustainability issues will create a whole set of inherent risks that I think we should be aware of. So integrating these two things and understanding how they fit together perhaps is something that people can use this conference to understand better. That is very well said. And on that note, gentlemen, it's been an honour to share the stage with you. I feel like we have gone on ho the whole day, but we have other speakers as well. So please join me to thank our speakers this morning for a really lively discussion. Thank you very much.